talk Beethoven 7 for a little while, because we'll do kind of a guided tour. So the key to remember about German music in general, and this piece in particular, is that music from Germany is usually about drinking or dancing, sometimes both, but rarely neither one. So this first movement is all about dance. It's completely dance inspired, and it needs to have the forward motion that comes with dance music. So the way Beethoven achieves this is by absolutely pounding into the ground with this Sicilian rhythm. Bum, ba dum, bum, ba dum, bum, ba dum, bum, ba dum, bum. It underpins the entire movement. So the key to getting this piece to flow appropriately is understanding how that rhythm works. So before we came in, I stole the board. It's really typical for people to put this rhythm and group it on the beat. And a lot of people will use the word Amsterdam, right? It fits the rhythm right, Amsterdam, 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 right? You get that, the word makes the rhythm, right? But it's actually a really ineffective way to conceive of this rhythm because it's very vertical and it doesn't have a lot of forward motion. I would encourage you to group the notes, not including the downbeat, and start on the, on the little note, and think of the little note moving into the next beat. And the words that I like to use are the big pig, right? The big pig, the big pig, the big pig, the big pig. That, that idea, thinking that in your head, will keep this rhythm falling forward at all times, which is the point of reinforcing this dance rhythm, right? If you're thinking, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, you're gonna be pounding into those downbeats and not reacting off of them. If you think, instead of gripping the notes on the beat this way, if you think of the downbeat as its own impetus and then group them off the downbeat, you'll have a lot more success driving this rhythm forward, right? Let me grab my bow real quick. So, it's the difference between an idea where you're coming on the beat
begun thinking of this middle period Beethoven, which we think of as heroic, the heroic middle period Beethoven. You have Beethoven three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, really, all fall into this middle period where a lot of things, there's a lot of use of really flamboyant rhythms. The harmony, the harmony actually settles down in a lot of ways and becomes less tumultuous, but he's using it to reinforce these feelings of, of grandeur, of, of thinking of the composer as the driving force behind the composition rather than the performer, which is a really important thing to keep in mind. Beethoven is finding his identity as a, as a writer and trying to force that identity on the musicians in a lot of ways. So that's a really good mindset to sort of think about this time period. We're more sort of egocentric pointed at the composer than we are to the performer. So that's going to manifest itself all over the place in the music, right? Beethoven sticks you right in there. There's no changes to be made from the score. Anything that would be improvisatory or that you would take liberties with, he's starting to get more granular in the detail of how he wants this piece to sound, right? So right at the beginning, let's take a look at measure 14, right? Something he's got right from measure one, right? He gives us a, a, a crescendo in one measure, right? 16 notes, all the way from double piano, all the way to double forte. This is a new, it's not a new idea in Beethoven 7, but it's a newish idea in this time period. We're getting away from this idea, like in Mozart 39. Of plain dynamics, where you're going immediately stair step from one to the other. And we've entered this movement of Beethoven, where dynamics begin to really roll and come back in a much more, in what some would call a much more organic way, right? So instead of that immediate shift, from piano to forte, he's introducing us to concepts like right? Big difference in terms of how that gets interpreted. When you find crescendo, also I find that it's it's a good idea to try crescendo to me means to wait and to wait to make the bulk of the of the dynamic game until the end. Conversely, when I hear diminu when I see diminuendo, I like to make that diminuendo more quickly. Not, not laser quick, but, but don't try to pace it out evenly across the thing. I like to think of, if we're gonna be sort of modern music graphical about it, if the measure is this long and it's even notes, I'll think of a crescendo more like this, right? where you're waiting, 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 still getting a little bigger, and then boom, it blows out at the end. And diminuendo as kind of the opposite of that. Right, where a lot of it's happening towards the goal point or coming away from the goal point. I think that that's a really powerful concept that helps make those feel more forceful because the bass is limited in terms of dynamics. We just don't have the top range that brass instruments or even cello does. Cello can blow, blow us out of the room all day long. The strings are higher tension, they're higher notes, they're more projective anyway. They have a much higher dynamic ceiling than the bass does. So in order to make those dynamics pop more, I like to save a little on crescendos and di diminuendo a little bit sooner. Um, let's see, what else is major? We also have another big change is these giant leaps right, coming out of these runs. We have right? a big two octave leap, and it, it only gets worse from there, right? The next one, it goes up to a high G, to a G, natural, nasty, right? Quintessentially Beethoven. He's taking simple harmonies and taking the weirdest intervals of them and abstracting them out into the scale lines, right? So what is that? We're taking we're taking A major, turning it to A dominant seven, resolving it down to D, right? So we have that idea, and what he's done is give you A, the major seven becomes dominant, right? G, G sharp and A major becomes G natural, becomes your dominant seven, resolving down to F sharp. But Beethoven does it 
by giving you G sharp here, G natural here, and where's the F sharp? The F sharp doesn't come in up until here, right? Next round, you get F sharps, three octaves spread, going to F natural, right? So he's taking these simple harmonies and chromaticizing them in ways that really make it unique. Um, pace is really important for this. It has to be insistent. This is the same, same idea as in Mozart 39. The tempo is not non-negotiable in that way. It's the same idea in Beethoven. may taper and slow down a little bit, but there's no forward and back. And the basic idea of this is just cleanliness and projectiveness. I think there's, even though it's a, it's a different style period, I think there's a lot of overlap to think of this stroke, almost like Mozart 39. It's at the kind of tempo where I'm thinking wider. I'm not thinking vertical like I'm thinking in Beethoven 5. It's just not fast enough for that. So you need to have more resonance that's going to come from a longer stroke where you're sort of landing that plane lengthwise. Try to preserve as much of that length as it goes towards constant speed as possible. You're looking about here. That's about right, right? So that's the general idea in this, in this introduction. It follows the exact same sonata form as you would see in the classical period. You have an introduction, big repeat sign at the vivace in 63. That's your exposition, right? Development comes at the end of the recap, or at the end of the uh, repeat sign. And then we find ourselves back to the, we find ourselves back in the recap at, he does it again and makes it super long. find ourselves back at recap in around K, I think. Um, but now we move out of this original introduction. Completely new tempo. We change time signatures. This is not super common. We do it again, just like Mozart 39, where we go from 4 to 3. We're going from 4 to 6, 8. So we're taking that 3 and instead turning it to 6, 8. So we have that similar idea. And now, from here on out, everything is completely dominated by the Sicilian rhythm, right? Sicilian, which is going to be this. Always moving forward, always leaning forward. So I'm going to have a start, uh, this spot right at the beginning of the exposition, just to get used to finding this tempo. It's, it's a little gross to have bum, da -dum, bum, da -dum, one, two, three, four. Right? Gotta stay quiet, but still projective in these small notes, because there's gonna be like 80, right? In ideal, in ideal terms. Now, Beethoven also gives us sort of a sforzando with more power behind it than what we'd see in Mozart. Right, so in a spot like 77, right, it's important to, to have a speed and a weight and a left hand accent. It all comes together. Sforzando is still the ceiling of what we can have in terms of accents, right? And it's no, it's no mistake that he's using the highest accent that's possible in piano, right? So that, that still applies when we're coming. Uh, we, got, we need sforzandos for every one of those downbeats. He put it there and he really does mean it. Uh, it really has to sort of pound this vertical rhythm, which does go against, in a certain way, it goes against this idea of having it fall forward. So for a moment, you're going to want to accent those downbeats when he's super sure about it, right? If he says, Sforzano's on the downbeats, that's what he means. For that little point, I would encourage 
looking at it on the beat, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, because that's exactly what he wants. Moving forward, right, the minute we get out of that idea, like in 89, the minute we start that, it's back to the big pig, the big pig, the big pig, the big pig. <laughs> Absolutely vital to keep that dance feeling flowing forward. That's going to underpin most of this whole thing. Um, the the bottom of page one is a common spot because it's it's a gross fingering spot combined with these bowings, right? <laughs> trouble going between A major and D major. It's really quick. You have to move in between first and third position plus in order to make those. It's back and forth really quickly. There's a lot of room to fall off intonation-wise. Right? And then he gives us more of this. Um, as we go up to letter C, something really important to keep in mind, we go all the way from double forte all the way down to piano, right? <laughs> There's no, there's no diminuendo, there's no subido. You crescendo it all the way up. You make it into C sharp or A major with C sharp in the bass. Immediately, almost the minute it resolves to B, plain dynamics all the way down to piano, right? Really difficult transition to make because you've just been going as loud as you can. You're ready to play, you're ready to fill the bass up, and then it's hard, right? To immediately shift gears in the piano. That catches a lot of people off guard. Um, let's see. That, those are the major spots to worry about in that first, first movement spot. Um, let's see. Now, let's look at the development. So top of page four for me, that's measure 224. This is where, in the development, he's making it very clear. He leaves off the downbeats, right? Downbeats completely gone. The big pig, the big pig, the big pig, we're going out from there, right? So Beethoven makes it very clear that this is all about forward momentum. Boom. Right? And he's going to change keys. This is the development. This is the, the weird cream filling in the middle of the cookie, right? We're in a weird spot, and he's going to be throwing these keys all over the place. For the most part, there is less to worry about in terms of fingering. But what I would always recommend is to group starting from the fast note. So, sorry. Right? If you're shifting over those short notes, that's something to reevaluate because you might be wasting motion. You don't want to be going. Right, shifting through that short note, if you can try to plan ahead. Right, I don't know, whatever fingering you would use, but group the fastest part of that bar in your left hand to avoid having, right, having that shift in the fast part of the measure. It's, gonna, it's not going to come out right almost every time. So if you can avoid it, try not to shift after that short note. Um, Also, one big thing to keep in mind is he, he makes a very clear difference between what looks like basically the same kind of rhythm, but is not. Let me grab an eraser. There's just one more key point in terms of rhythm and in terms of articulation. So we have we have the basic germ of this movement, which is our big pig, right? And we have B, what we get in the development section. Quarter note, 16th rest, right? Same idea, this rest, when it shows up, needs to be present. That means there needs to be a difference in stroke 
on the long note, between bum, 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 that's carrying more resonance through this beginning, and what you see in the novella, like bum, 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 shorten up that original stroke, shortening the, shortening the first note actually kind of makes the stroke a little easier. So maybe think about extra resonance on the long stuff, bum, 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 that's going to carry that through. But look for spots where he changes the rhythm by adding that rest in there. It's a 16th rest, right? I'm not crazy. Yeah. Right? Look for those spots of difference where that 16th rest comes in. That's going to make a big difference if that gets called. If I were smart, I would call a spot that had both of those articulations right next to each other to try to see who was going to have that attention to detail. That would be a really big one for me. Let's take a listen real quick, and then we'll go on. Let me, let me try to connect my phone real quick. Turn it up as high as it'll go and we'll see what happens. Alright, everyone ready? Let's take a quick, let's take a quick gander through some of the stuff in this first movement. Here we go.
again. Immediate changes in dynamic, right? Forte piano piano coming up the top. Now, we're transitioning into the X position. Instead of going straight from one to the other like Mozart might do, he introduces um, stuff from what's going to be coming forward, introduces it back in the introduction. And he modulates into the exposition by common tone. Now we're in. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. Ba -ba. Difference between eighth and sixteenth. We a beat. Six eight. Just pretend you're in six eight. Okay. Um, bum, 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 b
stuff be from? Yeah, just just think of six eight. Um, now I'm not gonna be in your key, but it'll take me four minutes to find this. This thing from the second movement, if we look after letter F, this is our second movement excerpt. It's really the only point on bass that really needs looking at. But it'll catch you if you don't pay attention. There are little spots in here. It takes a little bit of attention. It's all about delicacy and accuracy at the same time, right? Shifting back and forth from that 16th to the 8th. hair, I would tip a little. I wouldn't aim for flat hair. You're looking for a core of resonance, but a little bit of pop, right? Because he does write dots on these notes, so we want separation, even within double piano. It'll get you every time. And then we come all the way back. Pace it a little bit, but wait, save some until the very end. Ba, 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 all the way into that. So you maintain the energy that's building. That's the main point to look at. The rest of this movement is pretty sight readable. That you won't you won't typically see that in auditions, but if, if you're ever gonna play this symphony, that's a key point to keep in mind. So we're gonna go. Six after G or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Till when you stop playing, till you hit the rest. Yeah. yeah. This is a great one if you ever are feeling, well, it's not exactly happy, but it's a great one to if you're feeling a little bit low confidence some days, if it just doesn't want to come together. Throw this on real loud. Such a good thing to play along with. It's just a real confidence booster. Mm. I do that once in a while. That is Brahms 4. Really good confidence booster, right? Mm. Now, the exact opposite of a confidence booster is the third movement of this, which is another one that'll get you every time. We've had, just like in Beethoven 3 and Beethoven 5, Beethoven is making a decision to depart from what Mozart was doing. Normally, this movement would be a mini well. It would be a dance movement. But in this case, he gives us what he calls a scherzo, a joke. A fast movement in 3. It's very, it's dance inspired, but it's definitely tailored to the orchestra rather than dance music that just happens to be played by the orchestra, right? This is orchestral music first, if that just happens to be inspired by the dance, right? <laughs>
worth keeping in mind. This will catch you every time. I wouldn't recommend this, but it's an Ed Barker Boeing to bring out, bring out the downward motion. Ed Barker would go. disgusting. If it works for you, so be it. I think that's damn hard. It's not my it's not my cup of tea, it's not my choice. Something to keep in mind is that it's an option. If you're if you're looking for another place, um, second moon of Beethoven 9, another place he does that. Down 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 it's a distribution thing, is how he explained it to me. Right? It's tough. If you can make it work, you'll get that. You'll be enforcing those downbeats as they roll forward. It's especially tough because of the difference in range between and, and what that's going to require in terms of of amount of bow, right? You go from maybe an inch or two of bow to just a, a, just a little, right? Just a little bit on the bottom. So you have to be very careful to take less on your accents. Right? As you come down and become more compact on the bottom. But that's true regardless of the bow you choose. You're gonna go from different demands on the way you, you use your bow. I would recommend what what Ed, what not what Ed does, what, what Mr. Bradkitch does, add extra notes in, so three notes per bow. Right? Great way to do it. You can get your stroke up to tempo. I like to concentrate on the feeling of of travel on the downbeats so that your down bow on the strong beat takes you just an inch or two out to the tip and your up bows on strong beats take you back. So it's just a long version of right, so that you keep that accent pattern. I like to think of shifting just a hair outside the balance point and then just a hair inside the balance point. Because that's that for me is where the stroke lives, right? There's a lot of other nasty stuff in this movement that I won't make you play because it never ever gets called. I'll just take a little tiny spot from this. Uh, that, I believe, is going to cover most of Beethoven 7 because the last movement is never going to get called. It's really, really fun. I would absolutely recommend playing it, but there's nothing that rises to, to the level of big excerpts that are going to get called. If you see anything from this, you're going to see first movement excerpts. Uh, maybe that thing in the second movement. And if they're feeling very salty, it'll be something from this. But the, the last movement stuff is great, and it's worth learning, but it's just not as, as difficult. Let's take a look at it just so we know.
thing to keep in mind about this movement is that if you take a look at the score, Beethoven makes a lot of use of dividing the section between first and second violins, right? So that just like last movement in Mozart 39, the basic germ is right? From Mozart 39 comes right? Same, similar basic rhythmic germ is now turned into something quintessentially Beethoven because at that time, Beanie's orchestras would have had antiphonal violin sections. So if I'm conducting, first violin here, second violin here. And the way Beethoven writes this melody is he goes, dun -de 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 -dun -de 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 -dun -de 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 da 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 So they're constantly flipping back and forth between violin one and violin two. A lot of American orchestras do the standard thing, like we do at UNT, where they have violin one, violin two right there. The whole feeling of this movement is completely lost if you set the orchestra up that way. You'll see a lot of European orchestras will, will preserve that, and smart American conductors will do that as well. Right? So he's really taking advantage of that sort of antiphonal sound. Calling back to sort of earlier times, you've got to have antiphonal choirs sort of singing hymns in different, different parts of the church, right? You have this feeling of just a wash of sound coming over you. It's really something you play a lot. So, that's our sort of guided tour, Beethoven 7. There's a lot to keep track of, but a lot of it boils down to basically understanding these dance rhythms and not, not grouping your Sicilian rhythm on the beat, right? Think of the downbeat as its own musical unit, and then you're falling forward onto the next downbeat every single time. But I'm bum, 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 the big pig, the big pig, the big pig, the big pig. Every single time. And it'll be right on track. In terms of fingering, there are some spots that, that the bottom of that first page, uh, movement one, will trip people up. But it's not that inaccessible. It's not as hard in terms of the left hand as Beethoven thought. All right? Does anybody have, just looking through right now, does anybody have any questions? OK. Well, in that case, let's move backwards and go look at everyone's Beethoven 5 for this one. Thank mm -hmm. you.